Here we are again, dear Mike, Mike Mazzalongo, BibleTalk.tv, answering some of the questions that uh, many of you are sending in. Have one here from Jeffrey, a uh, little shout out to Jeffrey in Nambia, uh, in Africa. And Jeffrey uh, tells me about a house church that uh, he is starting in his mother's house. He had some questions about that. And uh, I want to congratulate him and those who are uh, trying uh, to uh, begin a house church uh, in, uh, uh, in a private home. And the question arises, um, uh, is it okay to start a house church? Some people have a problem with that. They don't think that a house church is like a real church. Uh, and it reminds me that for various reasons, uh, back in the first century, uh, because of persecution or lack of funds or uh, legal uh, impediments, uh, most churches were uh, in uh, people's homes. Uh, in the first century, they, they didn't go out and build a church building, you know, uh, when they had a lot of people. They, uh, they had churches uh, in private homes, sometimes in rented locations. We, uh, we hear about Paul in Acts 19, um, conducting Bible classes in the school of Tyrannus, which was a kind of a lecture hall, if you wish. Uh, but there were no dedicated church buildings at the beginning. Uh, and so those were legitimate uh, churches. Uh, think about that for a second. Here you have uh, apostles uh, and various uh, individuals who are writing uh, epistles, who are writing gospels even, and they're addressed uh, to different individuals, sent to different churches. And when we think, you know, the church at Corinth or the church at Ephesus, uh, we're thinking of some sort of large cathedral or some large uh, church structure. But actually, these were uh, people uh, in private homes who were receiving these inspired letters uh, from the apostles and sharing them with the people, uh, you know, maybe in their living room or in their kitchens. Uh, the slaves uh, in the household, as well as the children and the adults, uh, would constitute an individual church, and they would share this information, you know, with other uh, other uh, house churches uh, nearby. And so, the point I'm trying to get across here is that there's no uh, there's no need for permission. You know, people thinking, "Wow, I need to get permission to start a house church." Uh, you don't need permission. Now, you might need uh, some instruction. You know, you might, you might have to have instruction on how to do such a thing, but you don't have to get uh, permission uh, uh, from uh, somebody up uh, in uh, the administration or some church leader uh, to give you permission to start a church uh, in your home. Now, of course, if you want to start a Catholic church or if you want to start a, a Baptist church or Mormon church or Presbyterian church or any brand name church, well, I suppose you, you, you would have to get permission to use the name and to use the brand, if you wish, uh, of, that particular, uh, of that particular group. But if, if all you want to do is to start a church in order to worship God, uh, you don't need anybody's uh, permission, especially if you want to start what's called a New Testament church, uh, because there's no copyright on the idea of a New Testament church. When I talk about a New Testament church, I'm really referring to uh, a church that is based on the instructions found uh, in the New Testament, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is in the Bible. And so uh, there's no fee, there's no permission, there's no contract, there's no copyright uh, that you require if uh, you wish to begin a, a Christian a church, a New Testament church uh, in uh, the basement of your house or the living room uh, of your house. I know a fellow uh, in Quebec who transformed his barn. He had, a, he had an old barn and uh, he uh, turned that into a, um, a meeting room where the church meets uh, in, uh, in northern Quebec. And so today, as it was in the first century, uh, you really need only three things uh, to start um, a house church. Uh, the first thing you need is a, a Bible. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So the important thing, of course, is, you know, the winning of souls, the uh, preaching of the gospel uh, to win souls to Christ. 
And uh, Paul says that the uh, gospel found in the Bible, of course, that's the power of God unto salvation. So you need that and you need also the instructions that the uh, Bible provides for how to be a Christian. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says uh, every scripture is inspired uh, for, uh, by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, uh, so that the man of God uh, is uh, fully uh, equipped and prepared for, uh, prepared for service. And so in other words, uh, uh, you need the Bible because the Bible provides the instructions on how to live the Christian life, how to worship, how to you know, resolve issues and problems. It's your guidebook uh, for how to run, how to operate, how to function as a church, whether it's in your house or in your garage, no matter, even in an open field. Uh, the Bible gives you instructions on how uh, to uh, conduct a, a church. The second thing that you need is uh, you need somebody uh, that will actually preach the gospel uh, and, and, and teach the scriptures accurately. And here I read uh, from Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, beginning in uh, verse 14, Paul writes the following, concerning, concerning churches, concerning starting and, and maintaining churches and, and believers. And he says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news uh, of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so you need the Bible in order to uh, uh, have the information and the resources and, and the gospel itself. And you need somebody that's gonna go out and actually preach the gospel and, and teach people uh, accurately uh, from the scripture. Remember uh, what Paul says here, he says, faith comes from hearing and hearing the words of Christ. Faith doesn't come from you know, a, a permission from on high or, or, or the stamp of approval from uh, church leaders or organizers. Faith, he says, comes from hearing the words of Christ and the words of Christ being preached by someone who knows the gospel. Well, you don't have to be in a building. You don't have to be in a recognized organization from that. Anybody can do that. Anyone can do that from anywhere. You know, preaching the gospel is preaching the gospel, whether you're doing it from a, a million dollar pulpit in a $50 million building, or if you're sitting at a kitchen table with nine people sitting around listening to what you are saying. The important thing is that you have the gospel and you have someone who is there teaching it and preaching it and explaining it to the people. So you need the Bible, you need someone who's ready to preach it. And thirdly, you need repentant believers who are baptized for the forgiveness of sins and who receive the Holy Spirit and who then meet in order to worship God. Another key scripture, again, that I think is worth reading, that's in Acts chapter two, of beginning in verse 37. Um, in this particular verse, uh, Peter, uh, the apostle, is preaching the gospel uh, for the first time on Pentecost Sunday. And he's preached the gospel to the people and the people have responded to him and, and, and have asked him, you know, what do we do now? What shall we do in order uh, to be saved? And so we pick up the, uh, the action, if you wish, in chapter two, verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, they being the crowd that Peter was preaching to, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Meaning, okay, what do we do now in order to be saved? And it says, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Will call to himself how? Well, by preaching the gospel. 
okay? You don't have to do that again from inside a fancy building. So long as you're preaching the true gospel and you're calling out to people with it, you are legitimately uh, proclaiming the gospel and legitimately establishing uh, a church. But then it goes on to say, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So here we see the individuals who heard the gospel being preached by Peter respond to the gospel by being baptized. And then Luke writes that these very same people are now beginning to meet together. To do what? Uh, they're meeting together to pray, uh, to take the communion, uh, to share uh, their lives together, to worship, uh, uh, to worship God, and also to receive teaching from the apostles. It doesn't say anywhere that someone had to give them permission in order to, you know, meet as a group. And where did they meet? Well, they met in the area of the temple. And eventually, if you keep reading the book of Acts, you find out that they met in homes uh, primarily um, as, a, as a small house churches. So this is how the, the first New Testament church was started and how every other New Testament church can be started even today, it's not, uh, it's not as if that method is no longer viable uh, today. Uh, so uh, is it possible uh, and is it permissible to start a church in your house? The answer to that is yes. More importantly, not my answer to that, but the scripture's answer to that question is yes, of course. How do we know that? Because the very first churches were started as house churches. So you begin preaching the gospel from the Bible, you begin worshiping and taking the communion with those who are converted, and you have therefore the beginnings of a house church. Of course, there are lots of other questions that arise from that, and I'd be happy to answer those. I encourage you to send those in, uh, and we'll make another uh, one of these Dear Mike videos answering some of those questions specifically about house churches. So I hope that this gives you good information and encouragement if you're one of those who are thinking about beginning a house church. Well, that's it for this time. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.